All right. Um, hello. Uh, in case that's not obvious from the title, this talk is going to be about denial of service attacks uh, and most sp uh, specifically about defending from them. Uh, you may wonder how should I know uh, anything about denial of service. Well, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Marek and I work for a performance and security company called Cloudflare. And we provide a reverse proxy and CDN services to many websites across the world. Actually, we operate uh, a fairly large network uh, with millions of customers. And most importantly, uh, we are content neutral. And if you add that together, content neutral, many customers, you will see why we are experienced in handling now service. Uh, there's always someone hating someone in the internet, and this hatred is surprisingly often expressed in denial of service attempts. Uh, to give you some taste, uh, 4chan is one of our early customers. Uh, let me add some numbers to it. Uh, so this is a, a daily chart, chart of daily denial of service events uh, over the last couple of months. You can see that the max is, is, is quite big, it's about 300, but the general trend is that we see between 40 and 100 events a day. Some of them are very small, some of them are very large, so it, it's not really correlated with the scale. But this is a daily problem. Um, and the general idea of now service is uh, to overwhelm the target uh, internet service uh, with junk. Uh, this junk can be just raw internet packets, uh, or it can be proper HTTP requests, or it can be anything else. But the point is that the target always has only limited resources. And if the, uh, if the packets are large enough, if there's not l large enough uh, network traffic going in, the target will be just overwhelmed with just handling the junk uh, from the attack and will not have enough resources to handle the real visitor's traffic. Um, the, uh, the problem is that defending from denial of service is generally hard and it's because scaling out the attack is way easier and way cheaper than scaling out the infrastructure on the defender side. Um, and once the attack is successful, it can affect uh, multiple uh, layers uh, of the application stack. It's usually easiest to overwhelm the end application. It's usually enough to send uh, a thousand or a few thousand requests per second to overwhelm a simple WordPress or Python application. But there are many other layers. For example, uh, on Linux uh, uh, network stack, uh, for certain types of packets, Linux is not very scalable, um, and the um, and the processing is serialized across against one core. So for certain packet types, Linux will be overwhelmed with just an, uh, about 300,000 packets per second. Then there's the firewall layer, and um, the IP tables usually should be able to do about 2 million packets per second before falling over. Uh, to give you some taste, a network card, a 10 gigabit network card, uh, should be easily uh, should easily do 10 million packets. Finally, there is the network infrastructure itself, and always router has only limited resources. Uh, usually it's only connected with only a few cables to the internet, and th those, this is also limited. Um, it's in tens of millions of packets per second. Um, this presentation is mostly about the um, uh, Linux kernel uh, part. Um, the application performance part is way too specific. And on the other hand, the internet and kind of routing and BGP magic is fairly well uh, documented and understood. Um, all what I'm going to say here is, is kind of battle-proofed. Um, and for some of the techniques I'm going to explain, they actually took us quite a while to figure them out. But hopefully, by the end of this talk, you will know how to make your server more resilient to denial of service attempts. Okay, so what's the agenda? So we'll start with uh, network congestion, with kind of layer two stuff, and just we'll walk uh, our way up the, the stack, finishing at the very large botnets. Okay, so let's start with one extreme end, which is the network congestion. So what happens if the attack is large enough to overwhelm your network pipes and causes congestion? Um, unfortunately, uh, well, the traffic is affected and some random packets are being dropped. And unfortunately, the usual uh, way, the most common way of dealing with that is to use BGP now routing. With BGP now routing, it's a special um, it's a special contract between uh, your router and the ISP router in which your router is asking the ISP uh, to basically not route any packets to select IP addresses. This is pretty hardcore and actually will, it will make your service to be unavailable because you will just remove an IP from the internet. So the, the denial of service will be successful in this case. So the only way to counter it is to actually migrate your services across uh, IP addresses. And this is in fact what we do all the time. So when we see an attack against, say, our HTTP uh, address, then we just move the services uh, around to different IP address, and we null route the previous one. But we can only do that because we are well prepared. 
is because uh, we, have, uh, we have confidence in our DNS infrastructure that it can propagate the DNS changes quickly, and it's, it's also because we, are re we reduce the DNS TTL values ahead of time, so they are very small. Um, there's always a risk that the attack will, will follow onto the new IP address, uh, but you have to trust me on that. Many attacks do not actually follow. Okay, so uh, let's from now on, let's assume that network congestion doesn't occur, that you still have some remaining network capacity, that the packets are flowing nice, um, but you just see a high volume of packets. And the general answer is that you should allow the traffic to flow. Uh, there is no reason to block the packets on a router. There is no reason to null route traffic if it doesn't cause congestion. And if you will actually allow it to flow, you can see a chart like that on your network uh, servers. Uh, this is a packet per second hitting one of our machines during one nail service. And you can see it, it goes from uh, the baseline of about 50,000 packets per second to about 800,000 packets per second. And OK, what was in this particular flood? It, it could have been a DNS flood. Here's an example. It's just queries from random IP addresses uh, asking for resolution of example.com over and over again. And unfortunately, it will make your uh, DNS server to be pretty unhappy. There is no uh, DNS server in the world uh, that can handle 800,000 packets per second. Um, uh, but the big question is, OK, so where those packets are actually coming from? And here is the big, big news. The big news is they actually are not coming from your applications. They, it is impossible to get real traffic on this kind of high volume, especially on DNS layer. So those, those packets must come from illegitimate sources. And this is very important because if they actually do come from illegitimate sources, if they actually do come from denial of service spoofed scripts, then the correct thing to do is to drop them. There is no, uh, there is no reason to actually try to handle invalid packets that are actually spoofed. Um, um, not only it will use your uh, CPU resources because you will try to actually parse them, but also um, you can litter the internet with just re responses to random IP address. And it's fairly like that you will become a, D uh, a DNS reflection in this case, a reflection source. Um, to, give you, to give you some scale, it's, it's very common that uh, in our the attacks that we see that only one in about 10,000 packets is valid. So you can imagine how much CPU would be wasted if you try to handle all of those. Okay, but the big question is, how do you know if the packets are valid or not? How do you do know whether they come from the, that, the attack or there is actually a real traffic? And there are many ways. The, the naive way usually is to cut on packet length or to distinguish based on packet length. This is what, what many people do initially. So in the attack that I just showed you, uh, all the packets were f exactly 50 bytes of length. So an obvious thing to do could be just, just rate limit or just drop 50 bytes packets. But obviously, this is not very uh, selective. You can, there is high probability that a real traffic, that some real request will have exactly 50 bytes. So you can do better. Um, but in order to do better, you actually need to uh, do the processing on the uh, firewall layer. So for example, on Linux firewall, there are many ways to actually inspect the payload and to be able to distinguish packets based on what's inside them, not only on length, but also on the side. There are many ways. One of the ways is known as string module. The other way is known as the new 32 module. We don't like them very much, but we, what we do like is the BPF module. Here's an example use case. It's basically an IP tables command that will drop all the packets going to an IP address with some, some port and this magical BPF bytecode, which is basically a series of, of magical numbers. OK, that's very nice, but what, is, what are those numbers? Well, those numbers are actually a reasonable program. So this is a filtering program written in a BBF bytecode. It's exactly the same program as on previous slide. It's just represented not as numbers, but in more kind of programmatical way, more like assembly. You can see some loads, some stores, some jumps, uh, some arithmetic operations. So basically, with, with this BPF bytecode, you can express a fairly uh, rich logic in, in order to actually uh, understand what is in the buckets. And then if the BPF bytecode succeeds, the packet will be dropped. If it fails, the packet will uh, be allowed to to go further. BPF bytecode is not actually a programming language. Um, it is not Turing complete. You cannot have loops. And uh, the size of the program is very limited. It can only have 64 instructions. But still, it's extremely powerful. You can express very uh, rich logic here. OK, but where those BPFs come from? What, is, what, where, where, what they are? And this, this, the story is actually um, quite interesting. So originally, BPFs came from the TCP dump world. So if you ever run TCP dump, if you ever run Wireshark, you know that you can select, um, you can say it, please, dear TCP dump, give me only UDP packets, or give me only packets going to port 80, or only SYN packets. And what happens under the hood actually is 
TCP dump gets this expression and then compiles it into the series of numbers to this PPF bytecode and then gives this series of numbers to, to Linux kernel saying, dear kernel, here's my filtering program. Please give me all the packets that match this program. Um, and this was with us for, I don't know, last 20 years. Uh, TCP dump is fairly old tool. But it was only recently introduced to the uh, firewall layer. Uh, so only in 2013 um, we got an IP tables module that, 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 that could use BPFs. Um, but there are some problems with the kind of standard way of using um, BPF uh, expressions and TCP dump expressions. They're not expressive enough. Actually, the BPF uh, assembly itself is way more powerful than what we can express in this kind of simple expression language. So sometimes there are benefits in handcrafting BPF uh, uh, manually. And this is fairly cool to write this assembly by hand. And this is actually what we did. So we open sourced uh, our tools to generate those BPF bytecodes, uh, which are a bit more complex than the normal TCP dump expressions. And with that, you can uh, defeat the attack that I just showed you. Uh, you, can, you can try to, you can create BPF expressions that will match uh, DNS patterns. It can match DNS requests going to, for example, all subdomains of example.com, or it can do a case insensitively, or it can match invalid DNS packets. And actually, we are using that uh, very often to defeat DNS uh, attacks. And this is, this, these tools are pretty popular. Many DNS providers around the world are using them. Okay, so this is very nice. And with VPFs on the firewall layer, you should be able to do about 2 million packets per second. And your DNS server will be fairly happy because you will drop all the invalid packets before they hit the application. The application will only have legitimate traffic going in, so it will all work fine. Well, until a moment. It will all work fine until you hit this threshold of around, of around 2 million packets per second. Above this number, uh, your Linux machine will most likely fall over. It will just be very busy with just handling the incoming network packets uh, and just doing net network processing, not having enough CPU to actually do any application logic. This is called uh, interrupt storms. And, and there is a way around it, but let's first me uh, uh, tell you something about network cards. So uh, in modern network cards can actually split the traffic across multiple CPUs. How it works is there is an abstraction called receive queue, and the, there is exactly one receive queue for every CPU, and each CPU then has dedicated receive queue and receives packets from this receive queue, and does the usual processing of receiving the packet, going through the firewall, and then going to network stack, and then finally giving it to application. This is fairly a large amount of work, and this is why uh, this is not very efficient. Um, um, in, in kind of normal general purpose operating systems. The usual way around it is to use a technique called kernel, kernel bypass. And the idea here is that you skip the kernel altogether. Instead, you receive all the packets just from user space. You have a magical user space application that talks to the receive queues directly. There is no kernel involved. And you can just pull on the receive queues, receive the packets very, very quickly. And this is what many people are doing for, uh, to get bet better performance. Uh, but it has a disadvantage, which is you are skipping the kernel altogether, and you need to do all the processing yourself. And also, it is, fairly it is only possible to have exactly one application sit sitting on the whole network card. This is not very, uh, very good. We cannot uh, really afford dedicating a network card just for the kernel bypass. So the way around it is to use a technique called partial kernel bypass, also called bifurcated driver. Um, and the idea here is to keep most of the receive queues going normally to the kernel with the kind of slow path, with the kind of normal processing. You can have normal operating system features. And dedicate exactly one uh, receive queue to do the fast user space bypass thing. And therefore, you can get kind of benefits of both. You can get normal kernel and normal applications, but then you can kind of offload some part of traffic to the very quick processing in user space. We learned, that, we learned about that from the uh, solar flare uh, network cards, which support a magical EFVI um, library, which does exactly that. And we were so excited about that that we, um, we uh, did our own series of patches to an open source uh, uh, framework called NetMap. NetMap is supported on FreeBSD and on Linux. So with the, our series of patches, you can do partial kind of bypass uh, on hopefully your machines with NetMap. Okay, so why am I talking about that? Well, it's because this is exactly what we are doing to avoid interrupt storms. So what we have is we have an, a, an application um, that just sits uh, idling and listening on, uh, looking at uh, Linux kernel IP table statistics, and when it detects that there is a now service attempt and that it is likely to cause interrupt storms, it then fires out this uh, user space offload program. It takes ownership of the IP address that's being attacked and is able to run the BPF filters very, very efficiently, very, very close to hardware without any kernel in, uh, 
kernel and interruption. So this is, this is this basically allows us to scale BPFs uh, and avoid interrupt storms altogether. And this works fairly well. We, we are uh, quite often uh, able to do about 3 million packets per second with just using a single CPU. It actually works surprisingly well. Uh, here is an example of uh, the chart of the packets we dropped over last week. Um, this is all uh, this across all our uh, servers, and you can see it's about 75 million packets per second usually. Um, and although it is, you know, this, this 70 million packets per second are across many CPUs, many many machines. Believe me, some of the servers were fairly busy during this these attacks. Okay, this is very nice and very cool. But unfortunately, BPFs are not very effective against some of the attacks. Let me give you an example. So here's an example of an ACK flood. An ACK flood is a flag, uh, it's a flood uh, with, uh, of packets from, source, from random source IP addresses, with random acknowledgement numbers, with just one bit set on the TCP uh, flags layer, which is the ACK bit. And the problem here is it's not obvious to detect which one of those packets is actually valid or not. It is totally possible that one of those packets is actually totally correct, is actually belonging to real connection. So it is impossible to distinguish good or bad in BPF layer. And to make things even worse, um, the, all the acts are actually serialized uh, across against one data structure uh, in the kernel. So the performance is not usually very good. The good news, on the other hand, is that in, on Linux it's fairly easy to work around it. And it is with the stateful firewall called contract. And here is an example of rule that you can use uh, to basic, that will basically drop all the uh, invalid packets that don't belong to valid connections. Um, there, there's a bit of warning. It only works if you disable the TCP loose um, uh, setting. Um, it is important because TCP loose setting by default is enabled, and with this setting enabled, contract will actually create a new state for every new acknowledgement packets, even if it doesn't belong anywhere. So this is actually this is actually fairly critical here. Um, and this this works fairly well. You can do let's say you can you should be able to drop about two million packets per second, and this works fairly well against many TCP attacks, uh, with one exception, which is the SYN flood. And SYN floods actually are a fairly hard case. Um, it's because if you enable a contract, uh, and if you have a SYN flood, the contract will actually make your performance worse. It's because it will try to create a state for every new single SYN packet. Uh, so don't use contract here. Uh, okay, okay, if you don't use contract, what's going to be the performance? Uh, not very good, usually. Um, and let me explain why. And it's, it's because that's how SYN handling works in Linux. If you have a bound socket to, say, port 80 in your application, under the hood there are two data structures created. One is called listen backlog, the other is called SYN backlog, data up. And SYN backlog is the data structure responsible for handling incoming SYN packets. Uh, it's for every new SYN packet, it stores some state there, and then it sends out the SYN acknowledgement packet out. The question is, what happens if you have a SYN flood? This data structure gets full, and when it gets full, all the new syn, syn packets will just be dropped on the floor, will just not be responded at all. This is fairly bad, that's why there was zero in the previous slide. The only way around it is to enable syn cookies. So if, if anyone tells you at any point in your career, don't enable syn cookies, it's not very good. It's very easy to just deny service that's basically kill the service uh, if you don't have syn cookies enabled. Okay, so syn cookies is, is a bit magical. It's uh, this, the idea is to use some crypto magic to skip the syn backlog altogether and to send syn ack without storing any state. The problem is, since you're not storing any state, you cannot, not, cannot, cannot really save um, any interesting information. And there are some information that are actually fairly useful, like for example, window scaling factor or ECN bit. So you are going to lose them. So this is the argument, the usual argument against syn cookies, uh, which is you, you, you don't get the proper new TCP options uh, support with syn cookies enabled. Um, there is a way, way around it, which is to enable TCP timestamp. So this option, uh, with TCP timestamp enabled, Linux is fairly smart and is able to use a few more bits on the timestamp field to sa save some of the uh, in input important TCP options. So yeah, if you enable some cookies, consider enabling TCP timestamps. But even with all those magic, uh, Linux still not be able to, uh, will not be able to handle more than 300,000 300, packets per second. It's because all the uh, sync cookies are ser still serialized against one data structure. Um, so this is not very performant. Uh, but fortunately, there is a light at the, at the end of the tunnel. A new, not released yet kernel, uh, there was a series of patches uh, emerged from Eric from Google, which uh, uh, intends to solve this problem, to remove this, this lock, this, this kind of shared data structure. So hopefully with the kernel 404 onwards, you should be able to get around <coughs> one to two million syn, syn cookies per second. Okay, 
Um, let's move up the stack. Let's speak about botnets. Okay, so what happens if you get attacked by a proper botnet? Uh, the good news is that since it's a proper botnet, it will have a real machines, real bots, with real TCP IP implementations, with real IP addresses, with real network stack. And this is brilliant, because normally you will not see a very high volume of incoming packets. So this is very, very much different having a botnet attack versus the uh, kind of layer-free high volume packet flood. Okay, so you will not see many packets on the wire, uh, but you may see some other symptoms like concurrent connection count growing up, or sockets in my favorite orphaned state, or maybe time weights, uh, time weights will indicate that the connections go, uh, come and go very quickly. Uh, and again, it is uh, reasonably easy to overwhelm the um, end application, uh, say HTTP server. Uh, HTTP servers are not usually very scalable across many connections with some traffic there. But the good thing is, since it's real bots, since it's real IP addresses, real, real TCP IP implementations, the botnets will actually try to make as much damage as possible from each single bot. And that means they are very visible if you look at kind of top IP addresses. So you can basically uh, try to limit traffic based on IP reputation, based on wh where the traffic comes from. And this is actually what we are doing uh, all the time. So the first thing, uh, when we see an attack uh, that we think is from botnet, the first thing we do is we enable conlimit feature on contract. This allows us to make sure that a single IP address will not open too many concurrent connections to our servers. The second thing is we enable hash limits in order to rate limit number of SYN packets going uh, to us per second. And this, this, makes, this guarantees that there will not be too much damage made by a single IP address. Finally, there's a fairly cool feature called IP sets. IP sets um, allows you to do uh, whitelisting or blacklisting of many IP addresses in a very efficient way. Um, if you are interested in those techniques, uh, download the PDF of this presentation. At the end, there are like 20 slides showing examples of, ex of, those, of those IP tables modules. Okay, um, the next thing we found very um, effective is um, to disable HTTP keep alive. Uh, the idea is that a single bot will try to make as much damage as possible, and they do that by just repeating the same query all over again on the TCP layer, um, not really waiting for answers. So disabling HTTP keep alive makes the connections to be closed after each request and makes more SYN packets on the wire because the bot needs to re reconnect very often, and uh, we are fairly good at rate limiting SYN packets. So this is very effective. But unfortunately, those techniques are not very effective against very large botnets. The problem there is that uh, very large botnets have very large number of IP addresses. So even if you allow each of the IP addresses to connect to you once per second, it can still make a fairly high damage. Um, but there are some other ways you can do here. Uh, uh, for example, this is, an, the, this is an example request coming from um, from very large botnet, um, and it has a very interesting characteristic, which is in the host header, you can see the colon 80 field. And this is very distinguishing. It's very um, important. So what we can do in this case, we can basically look at all the incoming SYN packets, sorry, TCP packets, look at the payload, inspect the payload, look for this particular characteristic of this colon 80 in the host header, and basically cut the, cut the packets before they hit the application. Uh, this, is, this is fairly uh, hard. Um, this will mean that, your, that the TCP connections will be established, but they will just kind of wait for, uh, for timeout because you, can, you will kill the, uh, the actual TCP packets. Um, but again, uh, you will shield your application from the traffic, which is good. Um, and recently on our blog, we published a blog post um, of a fairly large attack against our services. So if, if you wonder how the attack was actually mitigated, well, now you know all the techniques. Um, okay, but this is not all the story. Uh, how do you know whether the attack is happening in the first place? So, so this is when detection tools come, come, come in. And what we found is that S-Flow is, is very uh, useful. So S-Flow is a technique uh, uh, hard on supported uh, by hardware, by switches. Um, and this basically means that the switch can sample packets that flow through it, say one in every thousand, one in every two thousand maybe, put them on the UDP payload of the S-Flow packet, and then shovel the S-Flow packet with the contents of some samples to a central location. And this allows you to do very interesting uh, aggregations and very interesting uh, stuff in the central location. So here's, for example, one of our tools, uh, which allows us to get a kind of TCP dump uh, view of the whole internet, of all our data centers. And with that, we can easily see in the central location what are the top IP addresses, what are the top ports, what are the top TCP flags, all the interesting stuff. So this, this is very useful. If you don't have uh, switches that support uh, S-Flow in hardware, fear not. Uh, there is a software implementation, so you can use that. All right, uh, thank you very much.
if there are any takeaways from this talk is that you will null route uh, on BGP layer your services sooner or later. So don't hardcore, uh, hunt hard code uh, IP addresses anywhere. Uh, make sure your DNS infrastructure is prepared and make sure you can actually physically migrate services quickly uh, around IP addresses. Finally, for the kind of high volume floods that you see, uh, remember that is very often that only one in about 10,000 packets is valid. Um, and for that, the BPFs work fairly well. If, if they're not, they're not scalable for you for some reason, uh, think about partial kernel bypass techniques. And finally, for all the kind of higher level floods, um, the IP tables are extremely powerful. So invest your time in learning about con limit, hash limits, and IP sets, and other kind of features like that. Uh, and once again, rem the reminder is that after this slide, there are like 20 other slides of hardcore CTLs and IP tables examples. All right, uh, thank you very much.